Hey. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I know it's probably not early for you, but this is really weird for me. Um, I'm so happy to welcome you to the SAG AFTRA Foundation conversation with an actor who I'm sure is in at least one of your favorite movies. Um, he's, of course, done everything from Six Feet Under to The Cabin in the Woods to The Visitor, for which he earned, earned his first Academy Award nomination. He is Hollywood's secret weapon. Uh, just his voice appeared in Spotlight last year, and that movie won the Best Picture Oscar. Um, <laughs> please join me in welcoming Richard Jenkins. Oh man, you're that guy that everybody loves, and I know it makes you uncomfortable when I say things like that. <laughs> but like just yesterday, Titus Burgess was sitting in this seat, and I had mixed up our questions. I had, I had brought your questions for you, for him, and he was like, oh, I love that guy. So. Uh, it's, it's weird that you can be an asshole your whole life, and people still like you. <laughs> That's the secret. Um, I do like to start by asking, because this is an audience of SAG actors, how did you get your SAG card? What was the project? Uh, it was um, a television, um, a, a th thing called Great Performances on PBS years ago. It was Feasting with Panthers. Uh, it was a play about Oscar Wilde. They adapted for TV and I was in the play and I went to, did they, it was, I had played a guard in, the, uh, in a small part. But they said, you can join SAG. You don't have to, but you can. <laughs> And um, it was like $500, it was a lot of money. This was 80, I don't know, 80, but maybe it was in the 70s, mm -hmm. 70, 70 something. So um, I said, you know, I don't think these chances come along very often, so I joined. Was it worth it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of money down yeah. the drain everywhere. Yeah. But you get screeners. <laughs> Yeah. You get screeners. I know. Yeah. At, at, when, when you first start getting you go, oh my God, screeners. And after about 10 years, it's like, look, it's screeners. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just realizing I first met you 10 years ago when yep. The Visitor premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, and one of the first things I said to you was that I had been trying to interview you for years. And you gave me this weird look and said, why? <laughs> and you were being dead serious. You were, I don't think you were being like no, fake humble. No. But I mean, how <laughs> has your life changed in the last 10 years since the Oscar nomination? Um, it's changed. I mean, not really. I still, you know, I still buy peanut butter and do everything. <laughs> but but, but it's, um, I think Jamie Cromwell said to me after I was nominated, you know, when you give your opinion now, directors will think it's something to listen to. When before you would say something, like, who's this guy? <laughs> um, and he was absolutely right. It's amazing. And is it true before The Visitor you'd never done a press junket? No, I never did. You actually, I met you before The Visitor. I met you at, when I did North Country. Yeah, well, and see, I thought you weren't at the press junket. I, well, I don't, th I think I was, I was in Toronto for it. And you said, you need a publicist. I, I did say and, that. And I said, what is, what's that? <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and, and you were right. You were the first one to kind of put that in my ear. You also said you would never get one. I did, and uh, is she here now? This <laughs> <laughs> is great, by the way. Bring it, great. Yeah, you got a good one. Yeah. Uh, so I want to start at the beginning. You were born and raised in Illinois. Yep. Is that true? Born in DeKalb, Illinois. You probably wow. some of you maybe vacationed there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, see, see, there you go. So yeah, it's uh, 60 miles west of Chicago. It's a it's a farm town. It, there's a university there, but um, uh, DeKalb agriculture was hybrid corn, and I detasseled corn when I was 14. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming nobody in your family was connected to the entertainment industry. Where, where did you get the idea to I be don't an actor? Know. I have no idea. I, I'll, I'll, this is a story that I've told many times, but um, I was around 12 and I had done one play in junior high school, it was a one-act play, and I came home and I told my parents I wanted to be an actor. But the truth is, I wanted to be an actor since I can remember. Uh, I, I never saw theater, because we were DeKalb, it was not a lot. Um, but I went to the movies every week, and I loved the movies, and I thought, how, how do you do, what is, how do you do that? And um, so I came home after I did this play, and I, I just had so much fun, and I said to my mother and father, I'm gonna be an actor. Now, I found this out after I was nominated, an article on me in the DeKalb Daily Chronicle. You've probably read it, some of you. <laughs> and somebody sent me this article, and in it, they talked to that English teacher that directed that play. And uh, she said that my mother had called her up 
and said, you have to talk to my father, uh, my father, you have to talk to my husband, my father, uh, he's being unreasonable. Uh, she said, what's wrong? She said, my son came home today and said he wants to be an actor. And my husband, when he left the room, said to me, it's never going to happen. I will not allow it. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. He cannot do this. This is not the way for a grown man to make a living. He'll starve. No, not going to happen. And she said, you have to, you have to walk him off the cliff. You have to talk to him. So she said, put, your, put him on. And he got on. And he said, I, I will not allow it. And she said, OK. Um, but if you do, you have to be willing to accept the fact that he will never forgive you for the rest of his life. Mm. And I never knew that. I, my father wow. was my biggest fan. You're kidding. Wow. Yeah. And <clears throat> I never got a chance to thank him. I never got a chance to thank my mom for making the phone really? call. You know? um, but my father, I always thought he would be disappointed if I wasn't an actor. Really? That's love. I mean, um, were they... <clears throat> Were they able to see your success? Yes, they didn't see uh, the nomination they weren't alive for, but I was in movies when they yeah. died. Um, and my father had a stroke, and I was in um, um, uh, the Woody Allen movie, Hannah and Her Sisters. I played a doctor. I had one phone call with him. It was about eight lines. And my father, it took him a while to do things, and he sat down at the theater with his popcorn, and, and he bent up. He said, I put my coat off, and I put my popcorn. He said, and I heard your voice. He said, oh, Jesus. And he said, I got back up, and you were gone. <laughs> <laughs> so they, had to, they stayed and watched the movie again. No. Oh. <laughs> um, well, you sort of mentioned going to the movies a lot as a kid, and we have a question from Andy. Sorry. Oh, over there. Hey. Uh, wants to know who have been your acting idols and have you had the opportunity to work with them? Um, well, you know, the, the truth is there are so many great actors. Um, it's just so many of them. And, but I grew up loving, like we all did, Marlon Brando um, and Spencer Tracy. Those are the two that I just flipped. But the one, the guy... <laughs> I mean, movies come along when we need them. Some performances come along. And I, I was in college, and I was, a, a, um, I was a, a drama student, and I had no experience. I'd just done that one play in junior high school. And um, I, I was terrified. I, they had to audition for everything. I never, he had to sign up. I never signed up. Because everybody else were stars in their high school, and I had no experience. So I was thinking about maybe, I don't know if I can do this. Do I have the talent? Do I have the will? Do, and I went to the movies, it was 1966, by myself, and I, I watched Alfie with Michael Caine. Mm -hmm. And I just, it blew me away. I just thought, ha, if in my life I could do something like that. To have an effect on anybody, like that had an effect on me. Here was this man, totally empty, and he had no idea. And it was so beautiful. Um, and it was, I never looked back. At it. I don't suppose you worked with Michael Caine and Hannah and her sisters, but... I didn't see yeah. him. I, he was, I was shooting in England once, and he was on the next soundstage, and I ran over. I mean, he wasn't there, but, you know, I don't know what I would have said to him if I saw him, you know. <laughs> you were good in Alfie. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably better I didn't see him. Yeah. So you've never actually met him? No, I never met Michael okay, Caine, no, no. That's crazy to me. You guys haven't been in a movie together. Yeah, well, I wasn't in that movie very long. That's, so that's right. You were in a movie yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. Um, you yeah. did have, if I recall correctly, one show business connection. Wasn't one of your bosses? Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> John C. Riley and I were, uh, uh, the last week of the Step Brothers, we were sitting around. I played his dad and talking. And he's from Chicago. And I said, what, what does your dad do, John? He said, my, my dad died when he was 58, uh, 59. He said he had, he had a... Uh, a hemorrhage, and uh, he said, my kids never knew him. My wife met him once. He said, it was too bad. I said, oh, what did he do? He said, oh, he was vice president of a laundry in Chicago. I said, oh, really? My, uh, my father-in-law worked for a laundry in Chicago. Uh, he worked for Union Linen. He said, my dad was vice president of Union Linen. I said, oh, wow. I said, oh wait a minute. John Riley was your dad. He said, yeah. I worked for him. I was a driver for five months trying to, before I became an actor, and he was my boss. And he brought his boat out to my father-in-law's little cottage in Antioch, Illinois. And he brought all his kids. He had like eight of them. And I put them all in the boat. And John was one of them. No I picked way. him up. He was like five years old. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So. <laughs> such a small world. I know. Incredible. And the, the thing is, uh, I 
I knew I wanted, I had to be an actor because I drove a laundry truck and had five accidents in four or five months. <laughs> so, I had one accident, I wasn't in the truck. What? How does that happen? I, I, it, uh, a laundry bag fell and hit the gear shift, knocked it into neutral, and it rolled down the hill, and it, and it hit a car, parked a car, and I came out, and my truck was gone, and I looked down the hill, and there was a guy standing there, it was half his face shaved with a razor, looking at his car and his truck, and there was nobody in it. And I, <laughs> I come walking down the hill, and I went, <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you let go or did you leave? No, voluntarily? because the boss, I actually ran into the boss's car when he was in it. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I said, well, I guess that's it. Uh, that's it for me. He goes, no, 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 it's okay. The car's fine. I said, well, I know, I just ran into your car. He said, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. No, it's fine. And I said, why? He said, because if you quit, I have to do the route. So it's fine. <laughs> so that was fine. <laughs> So you mentioned you studied acting at college, and that, that was like your first experience after this one play. Uh, is that where you sort of got your first exposure to training? Yeah, it was, um, you know, I, the truth is I didn't learn a lot. Uh, but w what it did was it gave me the confidence to feel like, I loved it. It gave me the love of, of acting. I just loved it. And I sucked at it, but I loved it. And I thought I was really good. And um, we all do in college, I think. We think we're all. But, um, uh, I made, I mean, it gave, it was a safe place to be awful. Um, but, you know, it was invaluable because I made friends. Uh, I had a professor who became a mentor who really, you know, told me, he said, once he pulled me aside one day and he said, you should do this for a living. You, sh you, you can do this, I think. So once I got out in the real world and realized how bad I was, it was uh, <laughs> but, but college was, uh, college was a great time. It was fabulous. You know, it was uh, I loved the school, Illinois Wesleyan. Um, I loved the department, had a lot of fun. So how did you realize how bad you were? Well, you know, I, I started to bore myself. <laughs> you know, and I thought if I'm boring myself, I can imagine what the audience is going through. So uh, I actually went to a play, I was in a repertory theater and I was there for 14 years. Providence, Rhode Island, the, the Trinity Rep, Trinity Rep. And, and I, I was in everything. And one time, this is when I left, I decided to leave. I was about there 12, 13 years. And I, I went to a uh, performance to watch. I wasn't in it. And the woman in front of me had a, <laughs> she, says, she had a playbill. And she said, oh, Richard Jenkins again? Oh, no, it's Richard Cavanaugh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you realize, you know, it's like, you, you got, are you going to get better? How are you going to get better? You know? Come to be involved at Trinity Rep. Uh, uh, there's another one, man. When you're old like me, you got lots of stories. Stories. <laughs> of good. I went to audition for Adrian Hall, the artistic director. This six foot four Texan. He can't talk to. Me. He was just like this ball of energy, and, and he was brilliant. He was this creative dude that understood conceptualization, what the theater could do, that movies couldn't. I mean, he was great. So I go before I go into audition for him. It's in New York at Theater Communications. I had no job. It's a long story, but I just. I just out of school and there was a guy before me that was singing and playing the guitar and it, you could hear beautiful voice and saying it you could hear Adrian hey, oh my god I got him. <laughs> so the guy comes out and he's like hey how you doing and, and so you're next oh god I got him. <laughs> so I do my reading or whatever he get and, and they say oh, thank you thank you I left I said, oh, okay a week later I get a call I said you're you they made you an apprentice uh, $65 a week $65 a week, yeah. Um, it's like, I'm, I'm surprised they didn't say, you'll only have to pay $65 a week. <laughs> but, so the first play I did with him, he came over to me, he goes, okay, now you, you, he never remember your name, he called you Thing. Okay, Thing, you, you, you play the guitar, you strum, strum, strum the guitar here. I said, I, I don't play the guitar. He goes, yeah, 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 I want you to play the guitar here. You start strum, I said, oh, Adrian, I don't play the guitar. And he looked at me and he said, oh, darling, that's why I hired you. Oh. He meant to hire the guy before me. Oh, God. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. <laughs> but you stuck around for 14 years. 14, 14 years, yeah. <laughs> and, and he was, he made me, he, he like made me direct. He forced, he said, you do this part. I said, I'm too young. It doesn't matter. You do it anyway. Uh, I, I, I loved him. I just loved him. 
Uh, I mean, did you have, you still live in Rhode Island, correct? I do. I um, mm-hmm. So, and you only went there for this job, but it ended up being your home. I thought I'd be there a year. Yeah. I mean, I'd never been to New England. I thought there were pilgrims with buckles on their <laughs> shoes. I had, I had no wooden sidewalks. I didn't know what to expect, you know, so. Uh, it, it was, but it was an amazing place, and I just lucked into it. Um, I, I, you know, it was to have that kind of experience. Uh, it was invaluable. So, <laughs> did you make an active choice to start pursuing film and television? Or? Yeah, I came out here for nine months, oh. ten months. Once I have a, uh, there's a friend of mine, James Satorius, who was an actor out here. We went to school together. He called me up. And he go, he had a series. He was like four years out of school or something. He said, "Come on out, man. I'll, it'll be great." So I, we just had a baby, and I was making 150 bucks a week, and I said, I'm gonna go for, you know, probably about a month. And I'll call you up, and you come out, and we'll, you know, like, I don't know, buy a house in Beverly Hills or something. <laughs> <laughs> I got I was here, I lived right off Sunset, uh, Laurel Canyon, um, and it, it's a carport. It, you can see it when you go up, there's, there's two, two of these carports with little apartments above them. Um, mine's been remodeled. It has a window now. It didn't have a window. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I was here for nine or ten months, and it was just brutal. Really? I mean, it was brutal. But I, you stuck it out. I, well, I, I, I didn't have enough money to get home. I had to borrow $200 from my uncle, who was in the Air Force in San Bernardino, for gas money to drive back home. And, um, but it was, it was t- I, I went to an audition. I don't know if you've done this. Do they still do this where you pay to audition? Oh, you, I don't you, you, think you, that's legal. Uh, well, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> and, and you pay for, the casting directors come and see your audition. Yes. <clears throat> and, and they say bring 15 resumes and you, you, p- resume pictures. And I had one that um, a friend of mine took, you know, I like, like you know, it's just this <laughs> weird looking picture. And so I got up and I did my little monologue and there were about, 20 of us, and I went back, and every single one of my pictures was still there. Oh. And everybody else's pictures were people had taken. So I was counting one, two, three, four, five, six, 15. One, two, three. I, I thought, well, may, you know, maybe I brought 16. <laughs> was, oh, it was awful. Oh my God. I had, went into an agent's office, and I don't know who this guy was. It was a huge picture of Mickey Rooney behind the desk. It was like the whole wall was Mickey Rooney. <laughs> And I said, is, is he a client? And he went, no. <laughs> I, I, know, I don't know who Mickey Rooney was in this guy. But <clears throat> oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. And, and I said, I will never come back here without a job. I said, it's just not going to happen to me for me. And so I went back home and I said, I don't know how we're going to raise our daughter. But my wife was a teacher. She's a, 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 a dancer. She's a choreographer. And she ran the dance program at an arts magnet high school. And so if it wasn't for her, I don't know what we would have done. It would have been awful, but. So what ended up being your break into film and TV? <clears throat> I was doing a play at the Long Wharf Theater. You don't know the Long Wharf Theater? Yeah. And uh, it was Holiday, and uh, Bill Tresh, who was a manager, the first manager on the East Coast, was there with Sandy Dennis. Remember Sandy Dennis? And halfway through the play, she said to him, sign him. I was 36 at the time. Wow. He came backstage and said, I'm, I'm going to sign you. I'm Bill Tresh. I said, yeah. He had Chris Walken. He made a star of Chris Walken and Sissy Spacek and Diane Keaton. And he was this guy, this, you know. And um, he did. He signed me. And I said, I don't live in New York. He said, I don't care where you live. He said, well, I said, I want to be in movies. That's what I want. Now, I don't know how that happens. He said, OK. But if I call you, you have to come in. And don't tell me it's too far. You got something. He's because it's not going to work. So for 15 years, I took a train in to New York, sometimes five, six times a week, from Rhode Island, which was about a four-hour train ride, you know, if it was on schedule. It was like five, five, and you know, it was. And sometimes you'd go take a five-hour train ride, and you walk in and get the script and say, "Freeze, thank you," and you go home. <laughs> you know, it's like five hours, and you get home and the phone call. But at least somebody was calling, mm-hmm. and. Um, George Miller cast me in The Witches of Eastwick, and that's really that's, yeah. that and that's was, the first. That was your first movie? Well, it wasn't my first movie. It was my first studio movie with, with a part. Yes. I was in Silverado, but I said Howdy, and then you can't do that, and they shot me. But, <laughs> yeah. but I, and I, I worked with Larry Kasdan years later, but I love Larry yes. Kasdan. So anyway, I'm with all of these. You know, Kevin Klein, who I knew a little bit. They're all my age and successful. Jeff Goldblum, and we were having dinner one night, and he said, "Who you play in this?" I said. Uh, Kelly. 
And he went, oh, you're Kelly. It's like nobody knew who Kelly was. <laughs> so I, I was a cover set. I shot my first scene the first day I was there, howdy. And then the last scene I had was a cover set. So if it got, the weather was bad, they'd go inside and shoot. You can't do that. The weather was never bad. I was sitting in New Mexico by myself for seven weeks. Nobody knew who I was in the hotel by myself. Snow is nine feet tall. Everybody coming home from work and nobody knew who I was. Um, finally, the, it, and I was going crazy. The last, uh, I think it was two days before the end of the shoot, I still hadn't worked. And I went to a party that Larry uh, threw and I was standing there, nobody knew who I was, so nobody was talking to me. And Larry went, came over to me, so sweet, Richard, how long have you been here? I said, seven fucking weeks. <laughs> and he said, uh, no, no, I met at the party. Oh! <laughs> so, yeah. And I used, to, I used to go buy milk, and I would keep it outside my window, because you know, I had my cereal and my little plastic. Th at the end of the run, I'm walking out of the hotel and all these actors are carrying their, their refrigerators back to the production. I said, where'd you get those? So they, they have them for you. And for seven weeks, I've been putting milk out on them. <laughs> I, I, I just... But he used you after that. I did Darling Companion yes. with him, yes. With yeah. Kevin Klein. Yeah, with Kevin yeah. Klein and Diane Keaton and Diane Wiest, yeah. Um, but but the, the movie for me was uh, Witches of Eastwood. Mm -hmm. It in which you were typecast as a wife-killing psycho. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, your wife throwing up cherry pits, you'd kill her too. True, true. <laughs> I'm on your side on this one, actually. How did that come about? Um, you know, I heard the rumor that my manager actually talked him into casting me on an airplane. I read for him, it was down to like two or three people, and Bill, I think, was on an airplane behind him. And he moved up to the seat and kind of talked him into giving it to me. But um, I don't know if that's true, but uh, it, was, it was amazing. Jack Nicholson was so great to me. I mean, yeah. I, I'd never done anything on film. And he would, you know, hey, how you doing? Man? Saw the day, like, yeah. just, <laughs> he's a sweet, sweet guy. Yeah. Well, not just Jack Nicholson, you're working with Cher, Michelle Pfeiffer, Susan Sarandon. Yep. I mean, yep. were you intimidated coming yep. onto that set? Yep. <laughs> yep. yep, they wouldn't let me on the first day. What? Because I lived in Rhode Island, we filmed in Massachusetts, and uh, uh, they would, the guard wouldn't let me in. The, I didn't have any identification. I just they gave me the address. I drove up, and I said, "I'm in the movie." He said, "Yeah, you're you and everybody else in town, buddy." And I said, "You got to let me in," because uh, and some grip was walking by. He said, "Yeah, you you know this guy?" I said, "Never seen him before." <laughs> so, but I finally did get in, and uh, and, and we were shooting. <laughs> We were shooting this scene um, in the church where she uh, goes crazy and I drag her out of the church. And we finished that shot. We had all these other shots in the church and finally they said, cut, okay, let's see, that's, we're wrapping here in New England. I thought, what, they cut all that stuff? No, we'll do it in LA. So I walked into Warner Brothers. Uh, was it Warner Brothers? I think it was. Walked into a lot in the set and they had to rebuild the church. I'd never seen anything like that. Just incredible. Was that your first time back to LA since the last time? Yeah, it's the first time back. No yeah. way. Yeah. You got to go back and be on the Warner Brothers yeah, lot. Yeah, I was, and it's the Warner Brothers lot. Though. You walk in those sound stages, and there's a list of every sh everything that's shot there. Mm -hmm. It's just really incredible. Yeah. Um, I have a question from um, I think it's is it Jeannie? Yes. Oh, there you are. Um, wanted to know if you found it difficult in the beginning switching from stage to film. Um, no, it's the same. Acting's acting. You know, it's uh, you don't have to talk as loud. You don't have to sit on, a, on, on the stage. You know, on the rocking chair. Sure, it's quiet out here. You know, so the people in the back. Here, you know. <laughs> I love these still nights, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, no, it's it's the same. It's the same. You can be bad in both meetings. <laughs> you know, I, 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 Technically, I mean, was it hard to learn, like, all the thing I can't get over is, like, hitting your mark and, you know, having a giant camera in your face? Harold Guskin, who is the, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of him, any, you, but uh, he's the guy that, uh, that kind of made me understand if I wanted to be uh, an actor that this is what I needed to do, these things I needed to do. Harold, actually, I knew Harold when he was 28 and I was 21. 
we were in a theater company together, and he taught acting in his basement. And um, I came up to him one day and I said, do you, you, can I take a class with you? He said, I wonder when you're going to ask. And, um, and he really changed how I thought mm -hmm. about being an actor. Um, but what was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hitting your mark and oh, hitting, yeah. yeah, he used to say because what you find is that uh, I don't know if you guys have found this, but I, it, everybody wants you to do their job for them, um, and it's I understand it. The sound guy, could you speak up a little bit? Uh, you know, you know, if during if on that line you turn your head here, the light's going to hit you. Um, the focus puller, you know, just just don't back up so much. When, <laughs> and after a while, you're acting, you're talking like that. Yeah. And, and so you, it's like, I'm not here to do your job, you know? So um, I said to Harold, I did, he said, just say, okay, and just do what you want to do. So you do, you go, okay, and then you do what you want to do. Because, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, but I, you find that, I find it less and less as I go along. I mean, these guys, and the, the technicians are incredible. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sound guys can figure out a way to, to, to mic you. And, and, but, but if you, if you say, yeah, 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 then they keep asking, you know, um, so. Something I noticed <clears throat> um, about your resume is, especially in those early years, you played a lot of cops and lawyers. I did. There's something authoritative about you, apparently. <clears throat> well, what was, what was it? I, I'm not going to play Tom Cruise's part, you know. It's <laughs> a, um, I had one agent tell me one time some, when I was in L.A., hitman. That's what you are. You're a hitman. <laughs> I said, like anything else? <laughs> No, just hit hitman. I think hitman for the rest of my life. Yeah, hitman. Yeah, be glad you got something. Come on. Wait, you know, I'm trying to think. Have you ever played a hitman? No. Yeah, I, no, I haven't. <laughs> I didn't think so. Um, one of your early breakthrough roles after Witches of Eastwick was as Josh Brolin's husband in Flirting with Disaster, and you mm -hmm. earned your first Independent Spirit Award nomination for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, but you didn't go to the ceremony. I didn't. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I was in Rhode Island. And I said, what is this? And they said, it's nice. I said, oh, how much does it cost to go out there? Said, oh, just send me the certificate. I, I, I was, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you were nominated again, obviously, for The Visitor. Did you understand the gravitas of it at that time? Um, no, until I went to the, the Visitor. And then I, it's just the greatest yeah. afternoon. Yeah. And then Bone Tomahawk. Oh, yeah, that's right, Bone mm -hmm. Tomahawk, which has traumatized me for yeah, the last couple yeah, of years. It's yeah. a great movie, but it, it's, it, it is traumatizing. It is. Um, and then shortly after that, you began a collaboration with Bobby and Peter. Is it Fairly or Fairly? Fair. Well, you said the same thing twice. <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't call me out on that. Is it, is it Fairly or Fairly? <laughs> well, which it's, is it? it? Whichever one you want. <laughs> yeah. They're both the same. <laughs> it's Fairly, yeah. I thought it might, if someone once told me it was Farley, and I was no, like, I don't no, think it's, it's that fairly. can it's be fairly, right. Yeah. Uh, they cast you in an uncredited role as the terrible psychiatrist, and there's something about Mary. And I know you worked with them again on Hall Pass and me, myself, and Irene. Um, is that a Rhode Island thing? Aren't they from um, the area? Well, we didn't know it when, when I did. Uh, no, I did Mary, and I was, uh, no, it was, wasn't Mary. I was doing some other movie, and, and uh, Bobby was producing it, and he came over to me, and he said, uh, so I didn't know who they were. I mean, I knew they were fairly, but I didn't know where they were from. <clears throat> and he said, um, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from Illinois. I live in Rhode Island. He said, I live in Rhode Island. I'm from Rhode Island. Where, where, where do you live? And we had built a house in Cumberland. I said, Cumberland. He said, I'm, I'm from Cumberland. Where, where in Cumberland? I said, Thomas Layton Boulevard. He said, that, that, Thomas no Layton Boulevard. I grew up on Thomas Layton Boulevard. Wow. I said, yeah, I, I, I live in the top, way up in the back. There's a, a lot we bought. This big boulder, he said, stink pot rock. You live by stink pot rock. I said, what is that? <laughs> he said, when we were 12, somebody peed on it. We call it stink pot rock. <laughs> I said, great, that's, that's the pr property value is going to go away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you think that that had anything to do with all your future collaborations, or you're just the go-to guy? I don't know. I mean, we just got along. We, we, they're funny guys. They're wonderful guys. And, um, you know, just... They, Call you up and go do it. Another, maybe it's just um, directing brothers who really like you, but you've worked with the Cohen brothers a few times. Yeah, three times. I mean, what is it like to get that call? Well, it's funny because I auditioned for them forever and they never cast me. <laughs> and um, uh, I, the Bill Macy part in uh, Fargo, I auditioned four, three or four times and I wanted that part and I was so upset. And then I saw the movie and I went, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, come on, yeah. But they would never, never hire me. And then uh, the man who wasn't there, 
they called up and said, would you come in and read? I said, no, I'm not doing that anymore. So he's not, not going to hire me. And my agent, I don't know who it was at the time, I think William Morris said, you should go in. And I said, no. So I get a call from Bobby and Peter. I mean, Bobby and Peter. From, from, you know, <laughs> Bobby and Peter called me and cast me in a Coen Brothers movie. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, um, uh, Ethan called me and uh, said, why won't you come in? I said, well, you're not going to cast me. I said, God, I've come in for every one of your movies. Uh, I was, uh, what was the one, um, Miller's Crossing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I was, I read for that three times, and my manager, bless his heart, but he, some, he, he called me up, he said, it's just so exciting. It's between you and Albert Finney. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I said, well, who the hell would you cast? <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, that's thrilling, Bill. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll yeah. pack my suitcase immediately. <laughs> God. Hey, you could have finally played a hitman. <laughs> yeah, could have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, and he, he was so excited. Yeah, jeez. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure they're struggling with that one. Yeah. So, but, but uh, and then he, he called me up and he said, um, um, well, would you like to do it? I said, this is how you get into one of your movies? You turn down auditions? <laughs> So I did. I did, and then, then I did two more. Wow, you're kidding. And did they make you audition for those other ones? Or no, they just no, they didn't. Up? They didn't. Um, they did Burn After Reading. They, they, they Actually, they wrote every part in the movie for every actor. That's what I heard. It's the first time they ever did that. And uh, I, was, I was in a car in Florida, and I got a call from both Joel and Ethan. They said, Richard, because I ran a gym in the, in, the, in the movie, and they said, Richard, um, uh, I, we thought it would be great. Um, you should really work out before this movie. I said, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, no, no I'm, 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 you just lift weights. Like, we have about two months. You really lift weights. I said, I, I, I do. <laughs> and it was a long pause, and they went, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but they let you keep the part. They let me keep the part. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have worked with so many amazing directors. Uh, you're working with Guillermo del Toro this year in mm -hmm. Shape of Water. Mm -hmm. What is it you hope for from a director? I hope he, he or she watches. He, they let you do what you're hired to do. They kind of leave you alone. Um, I don't mind direction, but uh, it's just how you're directed that, that I, I just don't like. I don't like directors who look for something specific. Um, if you look for something specific, you don't see anything. You don't see what's going on around you. And for me as an actor, and it's different for everybody, I don't know what's going to happen when, when we start shooting. And I, I don't want to know. And I don't like to make decisions or choices or um, objectives. That, that stuff I just pushed away, finally. And um, when somebody says, you know, I'll, act, I'll play dumb sometimes. If somebody said, you know, what you did with your hand that day, and I go, I did, I didn't even know. You know. I know what happened, but I don't want them to say, next time, take your hand and put it over here when the thing, uh, because it's, it, Anything that, that, any time you make a decision before you start something, it, it's dead. Um, actually, Brando said something once that um, the New York Times, when he died, quoted it, which I, I used to carry it around and read it to myself. He said, all of the work and all of the preparation and all of the rehearsal and all the, all the decisions and the hard work you put in before the close-up kills it. Mm. And the audience goes away and they don't even know it. Um, the only thing that matters is it, for it to be alive. And I love to watch a human being on stage or in the movies. I don't care what it's Shakespeare or a musical comedy. I don't care. I want to see a human being dealing with their lives. That's all I want. That's all I ask. I don't want a character shoved at me, pushed at me. And like, you know, I, I don't. What I mean by a character is that's uh, somebody who wants the audience to understand everything that's going on in their mind. Everything that, that oh, please. You know, when they say to their, to their wife, you know, she says, I love you, and then he'll go, and I love you. <laughs> and, and she's still, oh. you know, because he wants the audience to know that he hates his wife. Well, she knows it if I know it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's, that's, I just hate that. Mm. I hate it. Let, stop it. Stop right now. Stop. Oh, God. Yeah. You know, it, it, but people think that that's what it is. You know, 
Um, and it isn't. It isn't. It's, and that's why you see great performances. Um, um, Marianne Cotillard in uh, Three Days, Two Nights, Two Days, Three Nights, I don't know what that. I mean, my God. She's amazing. This, this, this woman living her life. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I try to do. Don't always succeed, but you know. Uh, it, it seems like the way film is set up sometimes, it can b do everything that, to the antithesis of that. Like it makes it hard to be in the moment because you do have to hit a mark. You do have to, you know, uh, look a certain way. Know yeah, but the camera one, once is. they say action, there's nothing they can do about it. Really? No, there's nothing they can do about <laughs> it. I mean, they can cut, but, but um, you know, th that time of all the preparation, all the, um, the Michael Shannon we were, doing, <laughs> we were doing, Shape of Water, the lighting was amazing, and if you have, when you see it, it's, it's so beautiful. But Dan Lauston is, it took a lot of work. He lit it like a black and white film, and we were standing there waiting and waiting. And Michael Shannon, he said, "I don't know what the problem is. I can see." <laughs> and, uh, that's that's how actors. That's how we think about the idea. Yes. Uh, but but um, um, once they say action, it's yours. Mm -hmm. It's yours. I can also hear him saying it in that Michael Shannon yeah, voice, right, so right. It's, yeah, right. <laughs> it's extra right. funny. Yeah, well, d oh, Michael, don't kill Dan. Don't, don't kill Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We have a question from Judy Carmen Gonzalez um, for Mr. Jenkins. Um, are you now in your comfort zone working on film? I don't even know. When was the last time you were on stage? Oh, 85. Oh. Yeah, never again. Really? No, no I never go back. Never go back. No, it's not, it's not that, I don't know if I could. It's been so long. It's a muscle, you have to mm -hmm. use it. You can't just walk away from it and not do it anymore. But it's okay, it was a decision I made. I, I just didn't want it, I wanted to do film. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I think Donald Sutherland the other night when we were at the uh, Governor's Awards said when he got his Academy Award, you don't know what this means to me. Because we, you always have doubts, yeah, I mean, it's part of being an artist, you know? And I don't know how you think of yourself uh, uh, as actors, but d d don't think of yourself as craftsmen, craftspeople, crafts. Think of yourself as artists. Whether, you don't have to tell anybody, but you look at your, what you do differently, I think, if you're an artist. And Yitzhak Perlman, it's an interpretive art, what we do, but it's an art. I mean, so is playing the violin, but you don't call it Yitzhak Perlman a craftsman. Um, he doesn't think of himself that, that way. If he did, he couldn't get the sound out of that violin that he gets. And it's just a little trick, I think, that we, you need to think of yourself as, as an artist. I do. Uh, I don't tell anybody, so don't you tell anybody. <laughs> Be, because the fact is, after some performances, I look at and go, oh, that's bad art, buddy. But, uh, um, but um, it's, it's, you know, I don't, again, I don't know what the question was. I can't remember. Last time you were on stage? Well, actually, oh, oh. her question was if you're in your comfort zone working on film. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no. But every new project is like terrifying. Mm -hmm. It's just terrifying. I, it's like, you know, it's the old story. They're going to find out I'm a fraud. And, you know, they, but it's terrifying. And you think, um, um, you know, I'm just, this is dumb luck. And a lot of it is, folks. It's dumb luck. Um, there's a lot of talented people. I'm sure there's many of you are much more talented than I am in here, but it's luck. It has a lot to do with it. Brandon uh, wants to know, oh, right there. Um, you always make such relaxed, strong, relaxed, sorry, strong, specific, and dynamic choices in your scene work. Any advice for also bringing that quality to the auditioning process? Well, they're not choices. I don't, I don't make choices. Um, and I think if it is clear, that's why. Um, it's, it's a weird process of, of letting go of it. Um, when you go into audition for something, they tell you what it is they want. You know, they get those sheets that tell you, he's this, he's that, he's this, rip it up. Because they don't know what they want until they see it. And when they see it, they go, that's it. Because the conscious mind cannot do what the subconscious mind can do. And, and that's what you, you know, I used to think if I sweated, I was acting well, you know, hard work. And, you know, it, 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 but it's the opposite. It's the opposite. You know, it's the lack of effort that makes it alive. That Gene Hackman always said, you know, don't talk to me for 45 minutes before I shoot. Why? I'm relaxing. I have to be free and open to, to let things come into me. Let the, I, I have to see things. If I'm 
if I'm arguing with somebody or doing, he said, I can't do it. I need to relax. Stay away from me. And when Gene Hackman says, stay away, you stay away. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, I, I try not to make choices. Um, but I also try to stay open to possibilities and not say, well, that's not how I thought this was going to go. Um, you know, I think Jeff Bridges says they're, they're like little gifts when things happen, when props fall or when, uh, you know, that's what you hope for. So, so, so the only thing you have to offer is yourself. And when you cover that up, you bring nothing. The, you're, you've got something that nobody else has. Nobody but you has what you have. And I, for years, thought I'm not enough. I can't be enough. But you are. That's, that's the, the beauty of it. But you have to be able, I mean, all of the anger in, in a scene or the, 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 uh, well, how you feel about things in this, it's you. It's you. And we always say, oh, we, we hide who we are. You cannot hide who you are. You're all you got. You're, you're the instrument. You're the violin. And, and your experience, and you, it has to come from you. And the way you do it is so different than the way anybody else will do it. Maybe they won't like it, maybe they won't, but at least it's an absolute honest attempt to, to, to bring something to an audition. If you try to give them what they want, you will fail, I think, every time. Does, uh, that, does that make sense? <laughs> and when was the last time you auditioned? 1948. <laughs> uh, I, I actually, I, I haven't auditioned in years, <clears throat> uh, but I auditioned for Nebraska. I, I asked, right. he, they asked me to play um, uh, some other part in it, and I said, no, I want to play the, well, now the Bruce Dern part. <laughs> and they said, you're, you're too young. I said, well, let, let me come in and read. So I, I came in and I read and, and we talked about it. And, and um, I don't mind auditioning. I liked, I liked to audition because it gave me a chance to act. But um, uh, it, it is terrifying. It's terrifying. It's, it's a, yeah. But, but the thing is, you know, you got nothing to lose <laughs> except the job. Um, <laughs> but it's really a matter of finding, of finding who you are and bringing that. To, because the truth is not, it's nothing against any, my, my, my dear friend Jeannie McCarthy, who's maybe the best cast mm -hmm. she's just, she, and I've been, Jeannie and I've been friends for years. Um, there was an actress we ran into last night. We went out to dinner last night, and we ran into an actress, a wonderful actress. I was just watching, um, I can't, but she said, Jeannie called me in to audition for something, and I was not, I was not doing very well. I, and Jeannie stopped and said, um, give her something to hold. Give her a plate of food or something. She was like, what? what? Why was she? Oh, get, get, so they brought some almonds out. And she said, I was just, so I started to eat the almonds. And all of a sudden, he started to relax. She said, I forgot. I was looking at the almonds, and I threw <laughs> one up, and I caught it in my mouth. And all of a sudden, the scene was over, and they gave me the part. Wow. Um, Jeannie had stepped in, saw it was not her, saw she was acting, mm. and said, let's do something to change this up. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, Jeannie was an actress first. I, that's where I met her in, in a Horton Foote movie in 19... 83 or 4 um, and so she understands what it is and, and she's seen so many actors come in and you know the ones you love are the ones who are who they are you know Sam Rockwell mm. <clears throat> I mean I just uh, Sam Rockwell you meet Sam Rockwell that's Sam Rockwell <laughs> you, you don't have to say I had to get to know this guy in the next month that's Sam Rockwell He's, my, my son's like that you, he is who he is and, and you see it on screen. You see, you know, he plays all these different characters, but that's Sam. Mm. That's his experience coming out. It's fabulous, it's fabulous. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned <laughs> you auditioned for Nebraska because you see, I can't believe you haven't done an Alexander Payne movie. He offered me the first one he did and I turned it down. Oh. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Was that Citizen Ruth? Citizen Ruth, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna let that sit there for yeah. a second. Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, are there any roles you've regretted turning down? Um, yeah, that, that yeah. one. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to touch on some of your TV work because I think a lot of people first came to know you as the late patriarch on Six Feet Under. Yeah. Um, did you have any idea? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I don't know, was that character meant to be so recurring in the show? No, it was only written for the pilot. 
That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we finished the pilot, and Alan Ball came to me and he said, "Would you come back and do more?" I said, "Sure, absolutely." And he said, "Because you, you know, you don't stop thinking about your father when he dies." Mm -hmm. He said, and I just realized that watching this, this, and so I would come back. I only did twenty of them, I think, in the five oh, years. Oh, really? Yeah. But um, I, I never knew who the guy was because I was always whoever was thinking about me. That's their impression of me. That's who I was. So I ne never really. But it was a lot of fun. Um, you'd come back. I usually open the season, come back in the middle, and maybe something at the end. And you come back in the, the first week of shooting. Hey, Richard, how you doing, man? Hey. Come back in the middle. It's like, hi, how you doing? And then by the end, he was like, <laughs> you say, Peter Krause. What? What? I mean, it was it was tough, but it was great for me because I just came and went. Yeah, you got yeah. the you got the good deal yeah, on that. Things are very different when you're on a hit TV show, especially one that, that resonates so much with viewers, like Six mm -hmm. Feet Under did. Um, did you notice, did people start approaching you at that point, or? Yeah, I got, I got some woman approached me in an airport and was crying. Why is this off the air? Why did they stop oh, us? <laughs> I want to say, because I made Alan Ball stop. That's <laughs> But yeah, it, it's it, yeah, yeah. It's there. You can flirting with disaster is change thing. Witches change thing. Flirting change thing. Six feet under change things. Uh, you know, it's like you have these the visitor, mm -hmm. um, and then you kind of go along as you are, and then something either happens or you you know. So um, there are you look back. The nice thing about being my age, you you look back on your life, and it's you see where it's come, where it's gone, and um, there's some perspective, and uh, you come to some conclusions, whether they hold true for everybody or not, but, but, I, I, uh, um, uh, but I can look back and see where things changed for me, which I didn't realize at the time. And how did you handle those changes, like personally, because... Well, I mean, come on, I'm not, I don't, you know, I don't have a... I'm Tom Hanks, I ain't, so it's <laughs> not, I, I don't have a problem, but I mean, people are really nice, and um, um, some strange things. Some, some woman stopped me on an airplane, it wasn't a while ago, she tapped me on my shoulder and turned around and she said, were you ever on the Bob Newhart show? I said, no. She said, are you sure? <laughs> because she said, you look just like him. But so I, I said, wait, wait a minute, what are, you, what are you asking me? Are you, are you asking if I am Bob Newhart? <laughs> or are you saying you had to look like him to be on his show? What, what, what is the question? <laughs> and she said, she, she said, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, this, uh, I was at a funeral. Oh, wow. When, during filming Six Feet Under, yeah. and uh, a friend of mine died, and I was at the funeral. A woman tapped me on the shoulder again behind me, and she said, are they filming this? <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's true. It's absolutely true, yeah. What is it most people recognize oh. you from now? Most people, depends on the age, stepbrothers, for kid, you know, it's yeah. like... Hey, Mr. Doback! I say, doctor. It's doctor, please. Um, uh, the Visitor, yeah, um, Olive Kittredge, some of the people. Um, you know, it just depends. Some people come and say, I saw you in that movie. <laughs> did, did you enjoy making that? Yeah, I enjoyed that movie. Yeah, that's the one I made. Is your name Roy? No. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> But pe I mean, people are nice. They're, they're really nice. Uh, have you been to Catalina recently? Because the wine mixer. Yeah, <laughs> they have. Ha I mean, they, it's Step Brothers is like the biggest thing to ever they happen there. They're the fucking Catalina. Yes, British, they have it? the hats yeah. and like it's insane. I mean, that movie's ten years old. I know, it, and that movie when it came out did well, but when it went to DVD, it just went crazy. Oh really? Yeah, it went crazy. Um, actually, I want to jump to 2008 because that was an incredible <coughs> year for you. That just that year alone, you had the horror film The Broken, one of the greatest comedies of all time, Step Brothers, Oscar-nominated Visitor, and a film with the Coen Brothers, Burn After Reading. Mm -hmm. Did you know that was going to be such a seminal year, or were you just working and they all just working? And all came out yeah. at the same time. No, you don't. You don't know anything. Yeah. No. It's it's just dumb luck, man. I mean, it's just it really is. Uh, I don't know. I, I you just. Do what you can do. You try to control what you can control and kind of leave the rest to whatever. And I want to start with Step Brothers because um, you've done comedy, obviously. Uh, Fun with Dick and Jane is actually, I think, one of the most. Un yeah! It's so good. It's such an underrated comedy. Um, but in Dean that. Dean Parasol. Great director, <laughs> Dean Parasol. Yeah. But in that, I mean, you're being required to improvise with John C. Ryland and Will Ferrell. Yeah. 
yeah, what's well, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> I once, uh, you know, and they had answers for everything. Everything you said, really? they have answers for. <laughs> uh, I was, they were watching TV, and I was disciplining them in some scene, and 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 I, I finished, and I heard Will say, "Blow me." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what did you say? <laughs> and John said, well, he, he, didn't, he didn't mean it like that. <laughs> I said, well, how did he mean it? Well, he meant if you, know, if you were into it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these guys, they were just <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I mean, I would think one of the hardest things to do on that set would be just to not laugh and ruin takes. Oh, yeah, it was. Um, the first second day, Adam McKay, the director, <laughs> somebody's cell phone off during a take, and he, go, and he said, oh, the, oh, the cell phone is on. He starts screaming. We're all sitting at the table. I told you to turn your goddamn cell phones off. And he's just, he comes into the set. Who's doing it? Nobody's around. He walks out and he goes, I'll call you back. <laughs> <laughs> it, was his, it was his cell phone. Uh. They're, they're just... They're, they're just, they're, they're hilarious. Uh, <laughs> the, he, we were doing the Catalina wine mixer, and uh, Adam said to me, <laughs> this is like, go tell uh, Will and John that uh, you wanted to be a dinosaur when you were young. I said, what? He said, go, go, go tell them that you wanted to be a dinosaur when you were young. I said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, just go tell them that you wanted to be a dinosaur. Action! I started this story about how I wanted to be a dinosaur, and and that my father wanted. So I went to m a medical school, and I thought I'd come back to it. And then, you know, and then Jurassic Park came along, and I missed out on that whole. And and John and and Will are going, Dad, that's not possible. You, what are you talking about? It was just, and I came back. I said, Well, that won't be in the movie. And it's in the movie. <laughs> so, so Thank you, Adam Scott. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm actually not sure which came out. Did I say out. Adam Scott? Adam McKay. Oh, sorry. Adam McKay. Yeah, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I thought... I, uh, I could have said Adam Scott. Yes. Adam McKay, who I also love, Adam Scott. Yeah, you've worked with him yeah, several yeah, times. Yeah, several times. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, you have a man crush on him in that movie, now that I Yo, recall. That's oh right. Yes, he's my favorite son. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, obviously, for The Visitor, you were nominated for every award conceivable, including a SAG Award, a Golden Globe, and an Academy Award for Best Actor. Um, I mean, I know you couldn't believe it. <laughs> no, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, I couldn't. But you also, like, with everything, like, there's something that keeps you humble. Was it the Critics' Choice Awards they wouldn't let you into? Uh, yeah, it may have been. It yeah. may have been, yeah. It was, it was like the, a, the same guy from The Witches of Eastwick. The same <laughs> there was one of those that I had a hard time getting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you were a nominee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got juice, baby. Yeah. <laughs> you want something done, come to me. What did he say? I don't remember. I don't, I don't recall. But I do yeah. recall being the, uh, not let in. You were eventually let in? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, you know what? You know, I think I actually remember. What was it? Are you punking me? Am I being punked? Was it oh, something like that? I, are you sure it's me you're talking about? Well, I think so because you like pulled up and the driver said, like, I have a nominee. And the guard said, who? Or what category? And you said lead actor in a movie, and he looked at it and said, am I being punked? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah, that, that did happen, yes. Am I being punked, yeah. That was going to be really awkward if it wasn't you. <laughs> well, it, I'll take credit for it if it wasn't <laughs> I have no idea, really. But don't you find that, like, you know, things like that keep you humble at the same time? Um, no, they aggravate you. That's what they do. <laughs> keep you humble. I, I, I'm humble enough. You know, don't insult me, for Christ's sake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how humble do you want? You want to like roll on the ground? That's a, yeah. No, it doesn't keep you humble. It's yeah. just aggravating. Yeah. But what was that whole experience like? I mean, did it? Did you find it changed your career as well? It did. Sean Penn came up to me one day and he said, "You have two weeks to cash in on this." I said, two? Fuck. I said, "That's all I got." He goes, two weeks." He was right. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You got to. Yeah, strike while the iron's hot. <laughs> but the first thing I did after that was Eat, Pray, Love, which was mm. something I, I, I had read the book and I, I loved the part of Richard from Texas. And mm -hmm. so that was the first thing I did. Um, 
and then it all stopped. <laughs> it all no, stopped. No. But, um, um, <clears throat> except you did win an Emmy for all of Kittredge. I did, yes. For supporting actor in TV movie miniseries. No, 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 no. Lead actor. Lead actor See, in a TV movie miniseries. I'm not miniseries. that humble, right? <laughs> <laughs> supporting actor. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking about this year. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Well, no, I, it was actually, that's the only time I've ever been to the Emmys, and I went to the bathroom, and you won. And I came walking back oh. in, and I was like, you're kidding me, I just missed. Like, they had the order wrong in the program or something, but. You know, just to know, she has been so great to me. <laughs> really, she's been so great to me until today. Scary. Um, no. <laughs> She's been so great to me at times when nobody knew who I was. <laughs> Everyone Janelle, knew. Well, Janelle was, she's amazing. She's been amazing. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Right. But I mean, that was, that was amazing. That's it. And I, all of Kitteridge is so fantastic. And, and you'd worked with Frances McDormand before, obviously. Yes, yes. We had worked together, actually, in North Country. And Burn After Reading, I was madly in love with her. And um, we were in The Man Who Wasn't There. We didn't do it. We don't have to eat. If, I mean, we were friends. But she called me up and said, I want you to play Henry. You're kidding. Yeah. Same thing as Tom McCarthy called me up for The Visitor. That's right. And he called and he said, uh, um, I, I wrote a script part for you and I want you to know if you want to do it and then I read it and I said to my wife Sharon my, my amazing wife I said you, you got to read this because you got to tell me if this is as good as I think it is and uh, I called him back and he said you want to do it and I said nobody's going to give you the money for this movie with me in this part and he said that that wasn't my question you let me worry about that so I said yeah and and Olive she called me up I was reading Olive Kittredge my Sharon said you got to read this book so I was reading it and she called me and said uh, I want you to play Henry and that's, that was it. So. And you don't say no to Frances McDormand. No, you don't say no to Frances McDormand. <laughs> you know, you, sh France, France produced it, bought the rights to the book, produced it, hired me, hired the director. Uh, most of the makeup people, uh, Carter Burwell did the music, does all the Coen Brothers. I mean, she was, she was there with everything. She mm -hmm. said, let's go pick out our props. Come on, let's go for about an hour. We'll go pick out our props. I said, uh, well, Fran, I'm, the props, my props, you're going to pick them out anyway, so why don't you go and I'll just, I'll, I'll use, I mean, I'm Henry Kittredge, you just give them to me. So that's what we did. And she had, she, she made up the, the meals, what we ate. Really? Yeah. No, it, was, uh, it was so cool. She's, I, I just, I had to love her so much. Yeah. Uh, was <clears throat> The Visitor the first time you were like number one on the call sheet? Yes. What is that experience like? It was when I went to Toronto with the movie. And I was, just before it started, it opened, you know, I thought, oh my God, if this movie fails, it's my fault. And, you know, you usually don't have that feeling when you're a supporting actor. You know, you're over by the craft service table and they say, it's not going well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did my best. <laughs> but if you're, if you're the lead in the film, and it makes you appreciate um, these great actors that, that carry movies because mm -hmm. it's it's hard to carry a movie yeah. and you know and if it opens you know if you have a bad box office it I mean it's it's a really tough job to be a star I mean they earn their money mm -hmm. uh, so that was my first thought was yeah you know, that's do you mind if I ask how old were you when the visitor came out well it was 2000 and 10 years ago 10 years ago I was 60 six, 60 one or two. I'm 70, so I'm 60, yeah. So 60 years old, your first leading role in a movie. Um, th that's, there is a lot of pressure on you. It's also probably exhausting to be on set every no, day. No, it was fantastic. Really? Yeah, it was fantastic. Really? Um, I remember Tom uh, came into our dressing, my dressing room was a uh, dressing room, it was a, uh, um, this tiny little thing. And he said, if I'd cast Morgan Freeman, I'd have more room. Um, you know, uh, but because a, a lot of studios turned him down because of me being in really? it. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's, that's you know, that's the way of the world. Mm -hmm. But like, he held out for you. Yeah. And uh, you've worked together since, obviously, in Spotlight. Well, Spotlight. He just called me up one day and yeah. said, would you do this? But it's a pivotal role. I did it on my iPhone. So crazy. Yeah. I, and we went to the studio and cleaned some stuff up, but it was basically my iPhone. I did it. Yeah. I know um, Tom said when The Visitor came out that when he told people he was basically doing a movie with you in the lead, so many people said to him, like, I wanted to be the person who did Richard Jenkins' leading role. Well, assholes never cast me. So <laughs> you, can, 
<laughs> you know, you can still do that after the visitor. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's not like, you know, like, oh, you did the visitor and then he died. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a good run. <laughs> um, that actually brings us to The Shape of Water, mm -hmm. Guillermo del Toro's. I don't even know how to describe this movie. It is so beautiful. It's a fantasy. It has literally all of my favorite actors in it. Octavia Spencer, Michael Shannon, Sally Hawkins. Uh, Michael Stuhlbarg. Marcos, Michael Stuhlbarg, who is like, He's, he's amazing in like yeah. 600 movies this year. Yeah. Um, how did that come to you? And were you familiar with Guillermo? Uh, Pan's Labyrinth, you know, yeah. that's about, it's not, you know, I'm not in the Hellboy world, you know, it's not something that I, but um, he called my agent and wanted my email and sent me an email saying, uh, I want you to play Giles. He sent me the script and said, I hope you love it as much as I do. I read it emailed him back the next day and said, I think I do. And that was it. That's wow. how it started, yeah. So you have Guillermo del Toro's email address. I do. <laughs> I, do. I do. He doesn't answer usually if you, if you send him any. When, when he won the, um, the Golden Lion at Venice, when, when Shape of Water won this year, I sent him an email that said, what's new? And he, not much, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> there was actually a great question. Um, oh, from Rory? Uh, oh, hey. Wants to know, how is it different making a science fiction movie back when you did, say, It which is Vswicked, as opposed to now with The Shape of Water? Um, there was very little CGI in The Shape of Water. I mean, Doug Jones was in that outfit. We didn't have, there was no green screen, really. I mean, there was some, there's some water that's added in, but, um, and everything was practical during The Witches of Eastwick. The, uh, when she threw up the cherry pits, that was a, a mannequin that they had on uh, controls, and they had cherry pits would spew out of them. And the thing, you couldn't control it, man. And we were all ducking behind the couch. <laughs> so so um, that, that's, but you know, it's funny, because I find that a lot of directors like to do effects practically mm -hmm. now. They, they'll do CGI if they have to, but, but like Shape of Water, he wanted most of it to be there for you. Um, but I, I was doing a movie, I don't even remember the name of the movie, but it was, here was, it was um, How I Got Into College. And there was a baby, and, and you, no, you didn't know. You, heard, you saw me in the beginning of the movie talking. You have to study, you have to work hard. You, you know, life is tough, you gotta get good grades. And then they pan and there's a little baby eating. And, no, there's applesauce that kind of hits me in the face. And you turn, there's a baby. Right, so I'm trying to get my kid ready for college already. <laughs> so. They, um, you know, I figured they'd take a spoon of applesauce off camera and mm -hmm. go like that. So they brought a gun in. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and, uh, okay, action. And I'm talking, as I'm talking, this guy raises the gun. <laughs> and I'm talking like this. And, well, you gotta study, you gotta work hard. And they, with the cue came, he pulled the trigger. I had a hairpiece on. It hit me in the head. I went right back off the couch. Oh. My hairpiece came off. <laughs> I had this big welt. Oh my, my God! Head. And I, all I heard was the guy said, "I think the pressure is a little high." <laughs> <laughs> okay, take two. All right, we fixed it. Take two. Okay. So I'm talking like that. Uh, Richard, stop blinking. Uh, what? What am I doing? Okay. Okay. Uh, you got to get into college. You got to study. You're gonna come. Uh, uh, uh. It was awful. <laughs> That'll keep you in the moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, something I love about Shape of Water and uh, all of Guillermo's movies, actually, is he does have these beautiful sets, this amazing production design, um, creates this fantasy world, but it doesn't overwhelm the performances. Well, it's, I didn't know what the movie was till I saw it. I thought I did, but I didn't have any idea how freaking brilliant it is. Really? Um, I, but I walked onto my set and I called my wife and said, you know, you have to see this. This is the most beautiful thing. It is, it, 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 everything in the place is real, uh, authentic, but nothing is real. It was, the paint was peeling, it was poverty that was so gorgeous, the reds underneath, there was a green, there was a, uh, it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, it was what I thought all movie sets would look like when I was in college, you know. The, um, and her side is, it, it, we share, there's an apartment that we share a big window, I'm next to her and, and uh, there's light from the movie theater below coming through her floorboards. You know, just really incredibly romantic and gorgeous. And, and it, it's his ode to all this, all cinema. And um, 
How he pulled it off, mm -hmm. I have no idea, but. Were you, I mean, do you usually do a project and sort of like leave it behind? And so were you pleasantly surprised when you saw the movie? I was blown away by it. Really? I saw it in an editing room and I was blown away by it. Mm -hmm. I just said, Guillermo, this is, and you know, he said to me, he said, if they don't like this, I don't know what I'm going to do. It was that personal. I said, yeah. that means you're an artist. That's because you're an artist. You put yourself in this movie. You know, this is what we're talking about. I mean, that's, and, and I think it's the first time since Pan's Labyrinth that he's really done that. I think that so he too. Is, that, and, and you see the response. Mm -hmm. um, and it is about the people in the movie. It's not about the color scheme. It's not about the effects. It's about the people. And, you know, Sally Hawkins is the, said, I would not, I couldn't do this movie without her. Mm -hmm. It's funny because he wrote all these parts for everybody. He wrote Michael Shannon's part, he wrote Octavia's part, he wrote Sally's part. Mine he didn't write. <laughs> <laughs> I, and he, he wrote it for Ian McKellen. Um, so the other day somebody asked me, asked Octavia, how did you get this part? Oh, we had breakfast, Guillermo and I, it was five hours. We talked and ate and laughed. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and as I was leaving, he said, oh, and I wrote this part for you, and, I, I'm, and I'll do it. Richard, I got an email that uh, said, I Ian McKellen's sick. Can you do this? <laughs> hey, however you get yeah, it, know, it worked I out, right? <laughs> it is interesting, because when I saw the movie, I, was, I felt like this movie was made for me. Like I said, it's beautiful. It's right up my alley. It's all my favorite people. But I didn't know that other people would love it. That was such a pleasant surprise. Uh, you never know that. Yeah. You know, people say, oh, you must have known. Nobody knows. You don't know anything. But it's not finished until somebody sees mm -hmm. it. That's what, why we do what we do. It's not, we're not doing it in a vacuum. You know? it's, it's, like, it's like auditioning. You're actually acting because you have somebody watching you. And, and, and you're trying to connect. You know? um, so in Venice, they wouldn't stop applauding. I mean, I, I, people say, it was a 10 minute ovation. I go, fuck you, 10 minutes. I can't do this for 10 minutes. <laughs> do that for 10, 10 minutes. 10 really? Minutes. Crying, Sally was crying, Guillermo was crying. I was looking at my watch, when's this thing gonna be over? <laughs> <laughs> so sentimental. Yeah, right. No, 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 I was moved, incredibly yeah. moved by it, yeah. It, it's also, it's not an easy movie to pigeonhole, and so the fact that it's been getting such uh, amazing critical response, and won The Golden Lion, you know, and, and has gone on to like charm audiences so much, it's, it's really the perfect package. Um, yeah, it's, it's all I can think of is just at this time of my life to be able to, to be a part of something like that is pretty great, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I love it to death. I've traveled the world with it. I've been to Venice and London and Toronto and, well, it's not the world, maybe, uh, That's Savannah. <laughs> yeah, it's, but it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing piece. I hope you all see it. When does it open, actually? Because it opens here on the 8th of December. 8th it of December, It op opens okay. in the 1st of December in New York and 8th here. Um, that's the one thing about seeing movies early. I never know when they're actually out. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Pam Paulson. He wants to know, what's your most satisfying role to date and why? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, there, there's, satisfa there's satisfaction and there's um, regret in every role you do, in every role I do. I mean, I can't think of a role I did where uh, every moment was, that's, I'm happy with that. So, but you know, I think, I say Bone Tomahawk, and I mm. say that because there was a speech in Bone Tomahawk that was one of the great speeches I've ever read in, in a film script. And all I thought was, if I screw this up, you know, how, and, and so what you have to do is you just have to stop thinking about that and just start living it. And, and it, it worked for me. So that, I remember that moment thinking, oh, okay, okay. But uh, there are other moments in Bone Tomahawk that I, I regret. So. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of along the same lines, Chuck, is it Isen? Isen? Oh, has a question. What's been the most challenging part of your career and why? Mm. You know, actually, uh, this role was. Really? Uh, one, one of the most. It was a really interesting guy. Um, he was a gay man in 1962 
who is an artist who's been let go by an ad company because they're using photographs and not drawings anymore. And so he's, he's competing to try to, it's for Jello, and he's drawing this, this, and he's absolutely alone, and he goes from his own world and his own, and he's in love with a guy, his crush on a guy who runs a pie shop. And um, his world falls apart. And it's a huge arc. And um, I got in the middle of it and thought, oh my God. Because I, I, I have to go from, Sally Hawkins falls in love with this creature, and I have to go from thinking he's a fish in a tank to her fiance. Mm. And I, I was, how do you get there? And you get there by not asking yourself, how do you get there? Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you just get there. You know, you just let it all kind of happen as you go. But it was, I was worried that, that it would not, it would not um, track. But, no. How do you generally prepare for roles? I mean, are you big into research or? It depends. I mean, it depends on the role. You know, I don't, I don't write backstories and things like that because it's, if it, you know, every hint and every clue is on the page. That's where you look. That's your, that's the mine. That's where, you know, that's where you, you go looking for gold. Mm -hmm. What people say about you, what you say, where you are, what you do, how you, you know, and that, from that, that's when the ideas start to happen. That's when, you know, you get these um, subconscious ideas about things. And, and I mean, I love accents and, and, and limps and I mean, that's not, I love that stuff, but it's like, where does it come from? And is it organic? And is it, is it part of a human being as opposed to being, you know, making fun of somebody or, the, um, uh, so it's all for me on the page. Mm -hmm. That's where, where you find it. And if you read a script and there's nothing there, um, you know, and that's sometimes you're just read a script and you're there to give exposition. You know, to say, you're my sister, <laughs> and uh, when our you were there when our mother died. Uh, remember, she fell off the ladder, and uh, it's like what the, f you know, why don't you tell? You know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, turn to the camera and go, you got that? Okay. <laughs> You know, so I mean, it's that, those are the kinds of yeah. roles that sometimes are, you were, in the early days especially, just like, oh man, you know. And then the star would go, mm, mm, ah, mm. <laughs> so, and the camera would be on him and you're yeah. just like, you know. And you go down 45th Street and you turn right on, yeah, it's just crazy. Uh, I notice also you have this really great balance of like really fun blockbuster movies, like White House Down, which is one of my favorites, um, and then you do do these independent films. Is that a conscious choice, or are you just taking whatever appeals to you? I take what appeals to me. Yeah. You know, um, uh, sometimes the money is, is <laughs> has something to do with it, but, but I, I'm in a time in my life now. Uh, you know, I don't, I only do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, because what are they going to do? Throw me in movie jail? You know, it's like, <laughs> I, 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 I still love doing it, um, but I don't, I mean, I have a new granddaughter, and my son just got married, and my daughter, they just adopted a baby, and you know, it's a great time, and I don't want to miss uh, too much of that. I thought it was interesting, you're in two movies this year where you play senators, mm. but they, they couldn't be more different. You're right. in LBJ, yeah. with the great Woody Harrelson, and then you did Kong Skull Island. Did, I did, I forgot I did Kong Skull Island. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun one, come on. Yeah, it is, actually, it's a, I saw it on a plane, it's a great movie. You saw Kong on a plane? Mm -hmm. No, no, you gotta no, get No, Kong wasn't on a plane, the movie was on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta see it in a big theater, it's really fun. Uh, it's too late for that. I hear it, it is fun though, it is, it is fun. No, it is, and I, I was just thinking like, yeah, you're a senator in both movies, but they couldn't be more different experiences. No, no. I mean, the Kong Skull Island, they called and said, would you come do this, and I said, no. Um, they said, we'll pay you this. I said, yes. And LBJ, I've worked with Rob before, and I worked with Woody, and I love them both. And uh, Rob asked me to do it. And I, I, oh, the reason I liked it, <clears throat> I, I, it's how do these guys really talk when, mm. no, when nobody's listening? That's what I liked about it, so that's why I did it. And what is up next for you? What are you working on now? Nothing. I'm Berlin Station. Um, oh, I yeah. did. Uh, we finished our second season at the end oh, of you're September. Kidding. Yeah, and it's on now. I think it's uh, episode six. There's nine episodes this year. It was on Sunday night. Um, but that's that's tough. That's five months in Germany. That's really? Tough. But I said this year. Last year was six months, and this year I said, look, you, you, I can't do it. I just I can't. So they they got me in and out. They 
front loaded me. It was really nice of them. Um, What's it like returning to TV all the, I mean, it's, it's, again, it's not TV because it's, it's yeah. you know, it's like, it's a really interesting script, great part, good people. You know, TV's different, you know, HBO changed that. Mm -hmm. HBO changed TV, you know, The Sopranos, Six Feet Under, um, all those series, uh, um, uh, the one about, about The Wire, I mean. So, it, it, there's a lot of great stories on, in TV. There's so many options, that's crazy. So am I right in hearing that you actually like have a break now of some kind? I have a break. I'm not going to work probably till somebody offers me a job. So like next week. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no I, I, actually have, I have said no to things. I, I just, I don't want to work for a while. Really? I no, I don't. What's a while to you though? Uh, you know, I, it's like, I know people say Frank Sinatra re retired. I think they're, it's going to be a headline, Richard Jenkins not going to work for a while. <laughs> and then underneath it'll be who? Um, <laughs> But, uh, I, you know, unless something fabulous comes along, I'd like to take this, you know, take the spring off. Are there any roles you're, I mean, you've done, and especially with The Shape of Water now, you've did, literally done every genre I can think of. Is there anything you want to do? No. I mean, I've never thought that way. Even when I was in the theater, I've never, I mean, uh, I've never said I'd, I have to play. I played Hickey in Iceman Cometh, which I, but I never thought, you know, it's something I have to do. Um, no, I don't think that way. I don't like knowing what's coming up. I don't, it's one of the parts about being an actor that I love is, is in fact, I left Trinity Rep when they offered us a year contract. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't want to know what I'm doing in a year. And um, I like not, I like having an email from Guillermo del Toro saying, would you do this, you know? And maybe that's for me. <laughs> it might be Hollywood <laughs> I, I calling. Might do it. Might do it. Um, well, I can't wait to see what you do next. Obviously, I will be you. there. And I do encourage everyone to see Shape of Water on December 8th. Um, oh, God, you made me think I got the name wrong. <laughs> yeah. The Shape of Water. The Shape of Water. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank I know it's probably that. painful for you. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. thank you, guys. <laughs>